Uh, I'd like to talk to you about integrating analysis tools with GDC 2.0 and harnessing the power of the GDC um, SDK. So let me real quick close some of my meeting controls. And um, let me reshare the screen real quick. Oh, here we go. So anyways, the agenda for today is going to be first a real quick um, overview of GDC 2.0, uh, followed by a review of the GDC SDK and API. Um, those will be presented by Craig Barnes and Phil Tom. Uh, following that, we're going to tell you a little bit about the GDC analysis, analysis tool challenge. That'll be followed by some resources for support. Um, and uh, after that, we will do our Q and A se session. Um, if you have any questions during the entire um, webinar, feel free to post them in the Q and A se section, which is, um, you might see it. I'm not sure what non presenters are seeing apologies. It's always different for different versions of WebEx, but um, if you don't see a Q and A panel right away, you might see these three dots here. And um, what these three dots, um, when you click on these three dots, you'll see, you might see the Q and A there. So um, that's a little different from the chat. There's also a chat window. We might not see your messages if you put it in there, but if you get your questions in Q and A, we will definitely answer them at the end. We might check the chat too, but the Q and A ones will definitely be prioritized. So moving on, um, I'm going to give you a very quick overview of uh, GDC 2.0, and uh, let's just to kind of show you how things work. If you need a uh, review. Now, if you've seen previous webinars about GDC 2.0, um, you've probably seen this diagram before. The basic GDC 2.0 workflow starts with building a cohort and using that cohort to download the associated data um, for um, that, are, that is associated with that cohort or that group of cases. And those cohorts can also be brought around to all of the different analysis tools um, uh, which will apply automatically to that particular cohort. So um, just to give you a bit more detail about how that all works, this can be broken down into a very easy three-step process. The first step is to build and save a cohort in the cohort builder. Right up top here is where you get to the cohort builder and cohorts are created by applying different filters um, based on case uh, properties. So in this instance, we use the gender property male, the primary site brain, and the program TCGA. And as you see down here, this is kind of where you click around and apply the different filters. The second step after creating your cohort, so now you have this group of, in this case, 652 cases, is to choose an analysis tool in the analysis center. Alternatively, you could go directly to the repository here, which will give you all of the data you, if you'd like to download data files directly. But if you'd like to analyze data directly on the portal, analysis tools is where you go. Um, each of these cards is a different analysis tool. And as you'll see on the bottom there, and uh, when you learn a bit about the SDK, they're gonna teach you a bit more about that, but um, the number of cases that this particular analysis, analysis tool applies to is printed on the bottom. Um, so in this instance, 391 out of the 652 cases in this cohort um, have data that can be used with the gene expression clustering analysis tool. The third step is really happens automatically. When you click on the tool, the cohort automatically applies to the analysis tool. So as you can see on the top left here, the brain cohort I created before applies automatically to this gene expression clustering diagram. And um, yeah, if you're more interested in the user flow, um, we have lots of other um, lots of other webinars on how to do this. Um, so uh, feel free to look at our webinar section. I'm going to show you that later. Uh, and if you give me just one moment here, okay. Um, then that's the end of the intro to GDC 2.0. I will pass it off to Craig. Thanks, Bill. Um, welcome, everyone. So uh, I'm going to go into um, the software development kit that we have developed for um, GDC and will be available for the analysis tool challenge. Um, I'd like to quickly just 
talk, this is going to go into a little more detail about web development. So um, it'll mention things like TypeScript, which is a version of a compiled version of JavaScript, um, React, which is a <clears throat> component framework, um, and web applications, things like that. So if you feel lost, don't worry too much. Um, I'll try to keep those high levels I can, but we do need to go into a little bit of detail. So um, just as an introduction, um, like a lot of different software development kits, um, you know, various different um, support for developing these these applications, um, as Bill, Bill was showing you on the portal, um, you saw several of them. So um, basically, we have the React framework, which is a UI uh, toolkit to be able to use that. Um, Redux is another library. There's lots of libraries in, in the web land, but this one is used to, to keep store state. Um, which means like, you know, I store a variable and I can get it back later or shared upon some components. Um, so, and we have, uh, there's a library that works, um, that we use, which are primarily for our, um, our UI components called Mantime, and that res that uh, works on the responsive design, helps with the styling, and uh, gives us things like buttons and fields to fill in and things like that. And then um, we've also developed our own UI components, which we'll show a little bit later, that are sort of more high level, that lets you, um, um, build some more more of the complex applications um, that we, we see in the portal. Um, and so really quick, our, our apps can access the core context, um, and we can talk about that. These hooks and hooks are basically just little functions that do various object call or get called at certain times while the, uh, the, the page is rendered. Selectors let you pull data from the uh, from your shared store, and then actions basically do things to, to update the store. Um, and then all this interacts with the GDC API, um, and there's there's a lot of functions that let you do that without actually. Um, so you have to know the API, but um, they'll they'll do this from the from the front end perspective. Next slide, please. So basically, our app structures are what we call high order components. So they're basically just like a panel. Um, and so we'll we, we'll see an example, and, and Bill's shown you some already. Um, and so they basically have like a bunch of UI elements. So they'll be the buttons, or our tables, our visualizations, local charts. Um, we have their own way of, of storing like the state, and then they have actions, and a lot of these actions can do things like alter the cohort, um, which is coming in um, that you're currently editing, or create new cohorts. Um, and so basically what happens with an application is that um, the, the system knows or the portal has like the idea of what your current cohort is, um, which is already selectable and you, you can see it. And so, and, and that's the input to the application. And then there's a set of local filters, which can expand upon um, the filtering and sort of help use, use to uh, sort of visualize or refine your cohort down or pick, pick various different elements that you're actually interested in doing. And then, as I said, once you've done that, you can either, um, save your cohort or alter it or create a completely new new cohort for doing that so um and our apps use as i said these hooks and selectors and actions uh for talking to the api and also updating local state as well um next slide please as i said we have a whole bunch of defined of hook selectors and actions and a lot of them are used to actually call the gdc api um or do things like get the current cohort or update the cohort or delete the cohort, um, things like that. We can use uh, the filters, which let you get certain types of uh, of, of facet data um, for the components you're building. And then also we have all these for the other elements of the GDC, which have things like projects and your, and your files and the cart. So you want to select files to download later. Those their functions to let you um, update that as well as, as well as the genomics and, and cases. So next slide, please. Uh, as I said, we built this component library. It's part of the portal. Um, and so unlike the toolkit we use, and all these are written with the toolkit queue, which is called Mantine, um, these kind of are sort of more specialized for the use of the GDC portal. So we have we have a couple different types of charts, which are bar. Um, we have the survival plot. Um, we have a Venn diagram for for showing overlaps between, between um, cohorts. We have things like our facets, which are sort of high level and that let you pick um, various different data elements or, and, and select values to, to help define your cohort. Um, we have a whole bunch from, from enumerations to dates to numeric ranges to ages, slightly different than dates, um, text, and even a Boolean one. Um, we have modals, and we have buttons, and some of these buttons have some um, sort of special uh, functionality. So, like, we have it so you want to, like in this case, an example here, save a new cohort with 20 cases. So those are already um, available. And if you you know the buttons sort of high level so if you if you add that button to your 
to your um, application and you process it, then you'll actually create a new cohort with these 20 cases. So without having to do much other calls than that. Um, next slide, please. So I'm going to talk you through um, developing an analysis tool so you have an idea of what's involved. So um, basically what I start with is you can clone the GDC portal repository, which has all the all the hooks and all of all the various elements I've been talking about already. Um, and basically you would put, um, you know, you'd start by creating a new new directory in what we call portal proto source features. Uh, and that would be where you store, store your app. Um, you'd try to figure out your structure, what data you need from the API, figure out what you want to store. Do you want to do filtering? Do you want to add charts, graphs? Do you want to add a table? Um, figure out what, what you need um, and then start developing those. Um, and then you, as I said, develop these application specific ones that are local to specific to your application, including the filtering, um, any specialized UI components you want to um, do and, and, and that. Um, recommend you add some test documentations and we'll talk about a demo so the apps can have a, a demo so like if someone wants to understand what's going on with it they can instead of having to like dive in with building their own cohort a demo usually sets up a cohort or to let them uh, show features of that particular app and then the last thing you need to do once you do that is you would register the application and we'll talk about that um, in a config file and you need to provide things like an icon description and we'll talk about the cohort account hook and some extra metadata next slide please um, so an example, um, mutation frequency, this is a great example of one. Uh, it's on the portal, it's an app, um, fairly complex. So as I talked about, uh, on the left is the local filtering. So the, the cohort's coming in, um, and that's the current selected cohort will show what's, uh, what's there. The filter lets you, the filters on the left let you refine that cohort down so you can pick um, very still different uh, filtering that you want to cut your cohort down with. There are charts which are responsive to changes both in the cohort and the local filters and there's a table. Um, and then if you, it's hard to see, but if you see there's these little buttons that let you create new cohorts based on rows of the table, which is actually kind of nice. So it's a very, it's sort of a uh, sort of all encompassing uh, app, but it's a good example of what, what they can do. Um, as I said, they do local filtering, they interface the GDC API via these these calls that we've talked about. Um, let you, this one lets you do things like add genes and mutations to the current cohort. Um, also create not only new cohorts, but also create sets. And then, um, you know, they also have the ability if you click on, um, and if you know anything about the portal, click on like the gene symbol, it'll actually pop up the, uh, the summary table. So, you know, the app has a lot of integration within the portal. Next slide, please. Um, you know, so if you're looking at an app, I'm just showing sort of like the, the file structure of how you, you break it up. And you don't have to do it this way, but it's kind of recommended. So we basically have things that handle local filtering. So those will have like the default set of filters that you want um, that come from the API. Um, a list of facets, which define like, you know, what what the fast, what the filters sort of the type are. If they have a description, you can put those in there if you want to. Um, the panel is just the UI component that drew, drew that entire um, left side panel. Um, and then we have things that let you fetch calls from the GDC API. Um, there's always an entry point to the, to the main, what we call the main app component. So that's the, the main call that the high level component lets you connect in. Um, and then we have these application specific uh, hooks and slices, which basically lets you maintain local state. And then um, a way to register the application with the portal so it knows um, that exists and, and will add We'll talk about how you add that to the analysis center as well. Um, next slide, please. Yeah, so um, we also have some calls, you know, I know this is really very detailed, but um, just to show how we're trying to help with app development is um, we have calls that let you actually build um, the, the store and, and register the app with the system and you get a bunch of, so it kind of helps set it up. Um, and these calls, once you do that, will give your application its own little store if you want to need to do that and, uh, and keep the, uh, the local state of the app. Um, in addition to talking to the, the global state of the overall uh, portal as well. Um, so those are sort of high level functions and they wrap a lot of like setup for you, but you do not have to worry about doing too much other than these, these calls. And there's lots of examples in the code base if you've cloned it um, of apps that you can look at to see how how these are done next slide please so once i said you have an application you kind of need to register it so you need to register the portal um, so it shows up in the analysis center um, 
there's like two steps. One actually registers the app, and this is the call to do that. We provide these high-level calls that basically uh, we talked about the genes mutation, so we're importing that whole tool um, from the uh, you know from where it's stored, and we're basically just saying, okay, we want to build it, so we pass pass this this high-level component to it. Uh, given an ID, the ID is actually created for you um, by this add app. Um, you give it a name, version, a couple of required entity types, which I'll talk about later, um, and a few other things, and then um, that's it. And then it now is is sort of created and, and stored within the system and available to be called and, and, and rendered uh, in the web portal. Next slide, please. So we didn't, um, if you look at the analysis center, um, this is just a really detailed uh, description of like the tool card. And so we provide these, but these are things also you need to provide for um, apps at, at some point when they get integrated into the into the portal. So you give it an icon, you obviously give it a name, a title. Um, there's a number of cases in the current cohort, and that can be a, a variety of numbers. So we provide a lot of functions that let you get like, if you filter, if you have a cohort, um, like I want to use a number of cases, or I want to know the number of genes. And so there's, there's ways of getting those counts. We provide a lot of functions to do that, but you can provide your own too in case you have some exotic like file type or particular uh, data type that needs to only work with your application. Uh, you can you can provide your own call that goes out, gets a count, and it'll show that. And that's important because what happens is, is that if this drops number drops to zero, then your app becomes, well, there's no data to render the app, so therefore it's unselectable. So this helps determine, uh, predetermine what the app can can make sure the app can actually has data, enough data to in order to run. Um, and, you know, you run the app, that's provided. Uh, and then the demo. So if you provide a demo, you just have to turn on a little flag that says, I have a demo, and it will launch in demo mode, and there's plenty of examples of, of that in the in the code base. And then provide a detailed description so when they open it up, um, a little more information about what the app actually does. So, And to do that, we'll go to the next slide, please. Um, we register it. And so it's just what you saw. So you go to name, an icon, um, some tags. Uh, eventually, we're going to get a lot of different apps. And so we'll have, uh, we, it's not turned on now, but we'll have the ability to like sort through apps based on their types and, and whatever the tags are. So the tags are kind of nice to have for, for this capability in the future. As I said, you if you tell you have a demo, you just say it's true, and it'll render the demo button. Give the ID, and that's the ID that it'll use to, to call it. And then uh, where the counts are coming from, and the mutation frequency is the case counts that have um, mutations, and then the description, and then if there is no data, like there's not enough data, then there's a little message which will talk about like why um, this, this the app card is unselectable. Next slide, please. Um, so that was kind of a high level intro um, and detailed at the same time of how you would develop an app, um, but we have lots of resources. So we have a developer's guide, which kind of walks you through this, plus a, this expands it out and we'll walk you through the development of, of an app, um, kind of what I did, but in a lot more detail. We have a style guide, so that gives you the guidelines for the colors and iconography, typography, and user inter, user uh, interface elements that we use and, and that those are available um, for to, to make the apps look well integrated into the site. Um, we provide API documentation um, that can be generated once you've cloned the repository and there's a command to do it and it's documented. Um, the nice thing is, although it's generated from the source code, what we've tried to done is we actually try to actually add tags um, and filter thing filter functions out that are like sort of not really relevant to your app development. Um, so just the SDA functions that you're probably interested in will be will be um, documented from the code. Um, and then as I said, there's a lot of uh, has a number of applications to, uh, you can use as an example to sort of get you started um, in in the development process. And I believe that's it. And with that, I'm going to hand it over to Phil. I'm going to talk about the GDC API. So the GDC API is how we make harmonized clinical and genomic data available. Um, both the data portal and the analysis tools that Craig was just talking about all get their data from the API. So there's a lot of data that gets uh, produced and made available. So right now, there's about 45,000 cases of data available. Um, these include about 650 clinical properties. And these clinical properties are things like demographic details or diagnosis treatments. There's also uh, about 200 biospecimen properties. Uh, and these will tell you things like uh, what kind of sample is it? Like, was it a tumor or a normal? Or maybe if it is a tumor, was it a primary tumor or a metastatic tumor? In addition to that, we also make 
uh, about a million files available. And uh, being able to uh, search through these files is about 350 properties uh, that are made available. Uh, some of these, for example, are experimental strategy, which might be whole genome sequencing or whole exome sequencing. Uh, we also have data category. Uh, some examples of those would be like sequencing reads, which would be like band files, uh, or uh, simple nucleic variations, nu nucleotide variations, or uh, copy number variation. So there's a lot of data that's made available, and uh, really the next parts of these slides are going to be how do we actually query this data and find what we're interested in. Next slide. So getting started. Um, so the first thing I would recommend is uh, to look at our documentation site. Uh, there's uh, everything I'm going to talk about now, plus a bunch more information is available there. So some of the basics, uh, the base URL for our API is api.gdc.cancer.gov. Uh, we make the data available through uh, a GraphQL endpoint and also through uh, several uh, RESTful endpoints. Uh, I'll be focusing on the RESTful endpoints for this uh, presentation. Um, as far as the data that's available, um, if you access the API anonymously, uh, you can, uh, you'll be getting all of the open access data. Um, there is controlled access data as well in the GDC, uh, some of which is uh, available through these APIs. However, uh, those have to be authorized calls. Um, I won't be going to that in this presentation, but the documentation does give uh, more details and examples about how to make authorized requests to the API. So the API, uh, I, you know, the RESTful endpoints, there's many of them, uh, and we can really bucket them into three groups. Uh, so first we have uh, endpoints that are related to search and retrieval. This is how do you get the data that you're looking for? Uh, the second group is analysis. Uh, this is uh, how we make some of the molecular data available. Uh, also, there are some where we're doing computation on the back end for you. And, uh, and then the last group is download. And that is you know, to actually download uh, files from the GDC. Next slide. So, search and retrieval. This is how, um, you know, uh, you can slice and dice the data. So you can query by any of those properties and then you can retrieve the value of any of those properties. Uh, looking at the right side first, um, our GraphQL endpoint is at slash GraphQL. Um, it, if you're familiar with GraphQL, uh, you can uh, use introspection on that endpoint and get the full schema back. Uh, and then for our RESTful APIs, these are three examples. Um, so we've got one for cases. So if you wanted to query back uh, any of the cases that are in the GDC, you'd use that one. There's slash files, which is for the files that are in the GDC. And then uh, there are some other ones. And one example is uh, projects. So if you're looking for uh, specific projects in the GDC and want then to get cases related to those or files related to those, uh, this is uh, a good entry point. Uh, so if we go on the left side of the slide, so earlier, you know, I mentioned that there's about 45,000 cases, a million files, and about a thousand properties. Um, and so in order to be able to sort through all of that and really find the data that's relevant to, uh, to you, uh, we provide uh, a query language. And this works, the query language works with both our GraphQL endpoint and our RESTful endpoints. And this uh, really allows you to uh, define your search criteria. Next slide. So this is the uh, kind of syntax for our query language. Um, the general syntax to define a single operation, uh, we start with op, which is your operator. And then we define the content of that operator, which is the operands. In this case, we call it the field which is the property you're interested in, and then value, which is, uh, you know, the, the basically the filter criteria that you're interested in on that uh, given field. So an example of this, uh, we can see that this one, the operation, the operator is equals, and then the content, we have the field is demographic.gender, and the value is female. So this operation says that uh, we're looking for data uh, where the gender is female. 
some of the examples of operators, uh, we have the equality, as in the example. We also have the inequality operator. Uh, there's also some numeric operators, uh, such as greater than and less than. And um, if you go to our documentation, you'll also find uh, you'll find a complete list of the operators that are there. Uh, but there's also a couple uh, composition or Boolean operators like uh, and or or, uh, and these allow you to then uh, compose uh, more complex queries and join these operations together. Next slide. So for the data analysis endpoints, um, uh, we have so if we're looking at our molecular data, so. Uh, for the somatic mutations, uh, we've got the slash SSMs and slash SSM occurrences. Uh, the difference between these two endpoints is slash SSMs is about the uh, the SSM, the mutations that uh, we observe in the GDC. And then SSM occurrences is uh, each SSM that occurs, it's every SSM that occurs in every case. Uh, so we can see which cases actually have these mutations. Uh, similarly, for a copy number variation, we have a slash CMVs and slash CV occurrences. And then uh, we also have a genes endpoint. So this is that same information, but it's now structured to be gene centric. So uh, we can look for particular genes that have particular uh, mutations or CMVs. Uh, for um, all of these, the SSMs, the CMV, and the genes, um, we can pass in filters so those. Uh, so we can, again, like kind of filter down to uh, more specific data that we're looking for. The gene expression endpoints um, is how we make our gene expression uh, data available. Uh, they behave a little bit differently than the previous ones. Uh, so first there's an availability endpoint, which will tell you uh, which cases and which genes uh, have gene expression data available. Uh, the gene selection endpoint will do automatic gene selection for you. Uh, if you give it a collection of cases and a collection of genes, or you can specify all protein coding genes, it will then go find uh, the most variably expressed genes uh, for that set of cases. And then you can specify how many you want, like the top 10, top 100, top 1,000, uh, and it will return those to you. And the last one is the values endpoint. This is how you get a gene expression matrix back. So you give it a, uh, a collection of cases and a collection of genes, and you'll get back a matrix of uh, expression values. Um, so if you were using the gene expression or the gene selection endpoint from uh, one up, uh, that would give you a set of genes of the most variably expressed genes for that given set of cases. And then you would uh, do those two into the values endpoint and get a uh, gene expression matrix back. Uh, another one of uh, the analysis uh, endpoints is top mutated genes. Uh, there's a handful of these. Uh, endpoints, if you look in the documentation, you'll see them all uh, listed. Uh, this would, for example, give you the um, uh, the case, if for a particular gene, it'll give you the, the cases that have the most mutations in that gene. Uh, and then there's other ones uh, that does more computation like survival analysis. So uh, slash analysis slash survival, uh, you can give it um, uh, a set of uh, filters that you're interested in that define different cohorts uh, and then get survival analysis curves for those. Next slide. So the last functionality group is download. So uh, we have the slash data endpoint. So uh, it's uh, slash data, it's the RESTful endpoint for downloading files. There is not a GraphQL equivalent of this. So if you're interested in downloading, uh, you do want to use the slash data endpoint. So what you give this is one or more file IDs, and then um, it will uh, you, it'll return that data. If you give it a single file ID, it will just give you that single file. Um, you can get the response as an octet stream, which is uh, potentially useful for um, some analysis. 
Uh, and then uh, you can also do a multi-file download. So if you give it multiple file IDs, then uh, on the back end, we'll create a tarball of this, and then that's what gets returned. Now, if we use the single file download approach, uh, it opens up uh, the possibility for some um, for some analysis on the file data um, in these analysis tools. So, an example is uh, we have some uh, clustering data from SIRA analysis for single cell RNA seq. Um, those files are small enough to, um, you know, fit in browser memory basically. So you could just download that file and then use that data to uh, uh, plot some graphs or do some additional analysis. Uh, another example is um, in the GDC API, we have another endpoint called slash slicing. This endpoint is doing BAM slicing. So you can specify uh, one or more uh, chromosomal regions that you're interested in, and uh, it will um, extract these out of the underlying BAM file and then return you a BAM file that contains reads only for those regions. Uh, and the way it works under the hood is that it's calling to, it's internally calling to our own data endpoint, but it's passing this additional header, which is the range header. And it'll say, we're interested in, you know, the bytes from 1,234 to 5,678. Uh, and this is how we're able to then you know, grab the specific parts of the BAM file that we're interested in and uh, assemble them into a new smaller BAM file. Next slide. So, um, as I mentioned, uh, the documentation site has more information, has everything I talked about, um, but then goes into uh, more detail for it all. Um, so, thank you. Hey, uh, yeah, thank, thanks for uh, the intro to the SDK and the API, uh, Craig and Phil. And now I will talk to you all about um, the GDC Analysis Tool Challenge, in which you can add your tool to the GDC. So the challenge goal, I'll read this because it was written very well. Um, it's to provide the research community with a novel analysis tool to analyze data in the GDC in support of cancer research. So of course, GDC is a repository of cancer data. So that's the data you'd be using. The analysis tool requirements are that the analysis tool needs to demonstrate a specific scientific need and innovation beyond what it currently exists in the GDC analysis tools. Um, the analysis tool also must use GDC data and must be able to integrate with the GDC using the GDC analysis tool and the SDK, all the stuff we just talked about. And then um, the analysis tool also must be open source. So on the right, here's an, a, um, many examples of different analysis tool types that um, could exist. Um, but here now is a list of different types of data that the GDC currently has. This is the data that's available to you for um, for analysis tools, some of which is open access, some of which is controlled access. Um, but I'm not going to go through all of these types because that would take all day. Um, and we have we do have a couple webinars that do go through all of these types. So I'd recommend searching through our webinars if you're interested. But um, to go through one very popular type, um, whole exome and targeted sequencing data. Um, this type of data has alignments in BAM format. These are controlled axes, raw somatic variants that are in VCF format in our raw variant calls. Uh, these are also controlled axes. They have annotated somatic variants, which come in VCF and MAF format, um, which are just, you know, the raw variants, but annotation information added to them, like a consequence. So um, that is also controlled axis. Um, the ensemble somatic variants. So um, the variant calls I was telling you about before are on a caller level. So um, you'll get one for mutect, one for muse, one for Verscan, et cetera. And um, the ensemble ones are for one case, they're all merged together, or specifically one aliquot pair, tumor normal. So um, they're all merged together and um, uh, they're merged if there are more than one caller that support each. So anyways, those are controlled access, but we do have open access variants and the mass somatic variants. And those specifically go through a, um, 
a filter that's very conservative um, and only keeps somatic variants, removes anything that could possibly be, possibly be germ one. So that's data that's available for whole exome and targeted sequencing. Another popular um, data type is RNA-seq. Uh, this includes alignments, three different types. Genomic is the regular RNA-seq reads alone, aligned to the genome. The transcriptome alignment is the same reads, but aligned to the, trans, to the uh, transcript. And um, the chimeric BAM includes the read pairs that map to different chromosomes. So if one read maps to one, one read maps to the other, goes in the chimeric BAM. Uh, there are also open access augmented gene expression counts. So the alignments are controlled access, but the gene expression counts are open access. This is what you see, this is where the data originates in the gene expression tool that we talked about at the beginning of this presentation. This includes raw read counts, as well as several different normalization methods in a TSV format. This also, there's also splice junctions, which are, which are controlled access, and transcript fusions. So um, these are all available for RNA-seq. So in terms of how we will evaluate the analysis tool, um, these will be the criteria. Scientific need, so um, how, that, how much that is needed in the scientific community. Innovation, the ability to integrate with the GDC data portal and use of the G GDC data, and the compliance with the requirements that were talked about a couple slides ago. So these are what they will be judged upon. And, um, the winning tool will be integrated with the GDC data portal and it will be made available in the analysis center. So when we showed you those cards before, um, if you create a tool that is selected um, to be the winning tool for this challenge, they will appear or it, it will appear in the um, analysis center um, just like this. So just to go over a little bit of information about the timeline, uh, from now until the end of October is the challenge registration. Uh, so if you're interested, um, we're going to show you how to get there. And the link's at the bottom, but I'm going to show you more in a second. Phase two is the finalist tool integration. So anyone who's selected as a finalist, um, this will include a demonstration of integrating the tool in a local environment. Uh, this will go from the beginning, beginning of next year to the end of next June, uh, June 2025. Uh, following that, um, when the winners are selected, the um, tool awards and recognition will happen sometime between October and December of 2025. So if you're interested in entering, here's the link below, um, but you know, you're probably not going to remember this link, so I'm going to show you how to get to it. So um, real quick, let me get out of this um, presentation. I'm going to show you a little bit of uh, things that you might be interested in. So. I'm starting here on the um, GDC website, gdc.cancer.gov. Uh, if you go to Google and you Google GDC cancer, you'll find this. Um, but anyways, um, if you want to know how to get to challenge.gov, you first go to support and then go to the left here. It says GDC webinars under training. So if you click on this, it would be, most of you probably already went to this because you signed up for this, but you may have gone directly from the banner or something. Anyways, um, this is the most recent GDC webinar, which is the one we're doing right now. And if you click on read more, there is a link to the um, analysis tool challenge here, which you can click on and it'll bring you to challenge echo, which has all the information you'll need to um, participate in the challenge. Um, of course, th if you're in, if you're also want a review of what we're talking about now, this webinar will be made available as a video as have all these webinars, if you're interested in these. Um, I know sometimes it takes a while for us to get these up onto the um, website, but for this one, because we have um, the analysis tool challenge, we will, be, we will be expediting it, so we'll get this video up as soon as we possibly can. The other thing I'd like to show you that we're brought up is um, if you're interested in how a user might interact with the GDC data portal, I'd recommend checking out the GDC tutorial videos which you can get to here. You can get to from a lot of places, but um, that, that's a good place to start. And this is just a bunch of videos for each of the analysis tools 
and some overarching concepts with GDC 2.0. And these all have a separate YouTube video. So if you're interested in any of these, go ahead and watch the video or read the transcript. Any are available. Um, now, for more information on the SDK, there's a link down here um, under Data Portal for developers. And now we're on a different website, docs.gdc.cancer.gov. This is our user's guide website or our documentation. So if you look at four developers, there's a um, a large document on the GDC software development kit. So lots of information is here. Um, in terms of API, what Phil just talked about, if you click on API on the top left here, you will see search and retrieval. This will give you information on searching and retrieving um, different things in the API and like information on oper oper operators and those kind of things. Downloading files will give you information on how to download um, files through the API. And data analysis will give you more information on um, using all of the analysis endpoints that Phil introduced. Also, if you're interested in BAM slicing, that has its own separate page down here. Um, and then the last thing, actually there's two more things I wanna plug. One is that the GDC front-end framework, um, Craig had a um, slide that had this link up here, but, um, here is it's github nci gdc and then gdc frontend framework. This is an open public repo. So, right now I'm on um, an incognito window to show you that you don't need to log into GitHub. Um, this is all made available. Um, then, um, lastly, if you have any questions that I'm not covering here or you can't find in the documentation, um, if you go to gdc.council.gov and go to support, um, there is the GDC help desk here, which will um, send you, and I have uh, the link right here, support at nci-gdc.datacommons.io. This leads um, to a help desk that is managed by my team, and um, we will always get back to you within 24 business hours. And, um, that or one business day, I guess you'd say. Um, but anyways, um, that is all I have for the resources. So now um, Craig, Phil, and I are happy to answer any questions you have. Okay, uh, we have one question. Um, can we use a server-side language or JS slash TS is required? Um, Craig, I will... Give, give that one to you. Um, yeah, that is a good question. Um, I mean, our apps are really designed to work within like the Next.js framework. So um, I'm not sure, unless you can tell me what server side language you're thinking of. Um, yeah, I'm not. I'm not 100 sure because one of the problems is is that you'd have to we'd have to support the app Python. Yeah, that would be uh, I think somewhat difficult um, to support an app that was written in Python. Sorry. Thanks, Craig. All right. Hey, we got another question here. Um, do we only work with open access data for GDC tool challenge? So um, can we only use open access data or is controlled access data available? Um, so I, I'm under the impression that um, both are available. It's just the controlled access data does require a lot of authentication, and um, you know, just to make sure that everyone has the correct permissions. Um, Phil or Craig, do you have anything to add to that? Uh, the data access is already in place. So if you're making authorized calls, it would require your user to be logged in and to have access to the controlled access data. Um, the analysis tool itself cannot provide that, um, that authorization the user has to be. So um, I, I don't think there's um, any problems with doing that. Um, I, our current analysis tools, some of them will pull in controlled access data uh, if the user is logged in. And if I the user is authorized. Uh, yeah, I can help. So one of the things is that the 
development team will need to have authorization for that data, whoever is developing it. So, so if you're using control access data, you will need to go through dbGaP and have get access for that data set. And then, like Phil just said, that once you um, the GDC supports the framework to get access. Well, once the user logs in and they have access, but and then you have to pass that token every time. Um, so it supports the infrastructure supports it, but actually, it's so so it is also part of the development team to have access to it. Yes, and uh, getting access to that data. Um, how to so if you're interested in gaining access to data from GDC. Uh, we have lots and lots of guides. Let me get some of these WebEx windows out of the way real quick. Um, if you go to access data on gdc.cancer.gov and you click on obtaining access to, access to controlled data, um, we have all the information there. Um, the general process is to get an ERA Commons account, use that to obtain dbGaP access. You basically write uh, kind of a, a proposal to um, show that the uh, project you're doing does need access to that project. And then, um, you know, you'll go through them and that data is automatically brought over to the GDC. And if you're interested in how you would identify which specific, um, uh, which specific data set, um, you can get to that if you go to portal.gdc.cancer.gov and there's a specific, like, um, data set you're interested in, um, like a project. If you go look up that project, um, down here, if you click on any of these, so let's say CPTAC three, that's one of the projects. Um, here's the dbGaP study accession. So this, this particular accession, this PHS number is what gives you, which, what is associated with your ERA commons ID. And we get notification that says this person has access to this data set. So, um, dbGaP study accession, that's the one you're looking for. And, um, um, yeah, uh, this actually leads you directly to dbGaP. So if you click on the link, it'll bring you to the project. It shows you all the different data policies, processes, all that. So, um, I'd recommend checking out our documentation on that. And we're happy to answer any questions you have if you reach out to us. Um, oh, here we go. Um, we have one more question here. Um, which JavaScript libraries do you recommend for using machine learning for app development? Um, Craig or Phil, do you have any recommendations? I can I can jump in on that one. So um, yeah, you can for app development. I mean, pretty much. I think we can permit a selection of any of them. I mean, I've used TensorFlow and I've used Brain uh, TensorFlow.js and Brain.js. Um, but really, I think uh, you know. I mean, obviously, the apps can have their own package dependencies, so we can and we'll. we'll you know, figure that out when we integrate. But um, yeah, I think I think we're fairly open to to not preventing you from using something if you really want to use it. I think the only thing is you have to realize that you know some that take advantage of say you know a GPU or something is only going to really run you know well on a browser that happens to have a GPU. But you know you you know what you you know there are limitations to how much you can do on using JavaScript. But it's it you know there's ways to do a fair amount with any of these libraries there's a good number um if you have if you pick, pick one that seems you know really exotic and have questions feel free to contact us okay um any any more questions uh we'll give you a minute or so to uh get one into the q and a q and a panel if you can't find that feel free to type in the chat i got i have that window open Okay, great. Well, um, yeah, thank you all so much for attending and um, for your interest in the GDC software development kit and the GDC analysis tool challenge. Um, Sharon, do you have any, any last minute messages you'd like to uh, give to the group? No, just uh, thanks, Bill and Phil and Craig for um, this uh, really good presentation and thanks all of our webinar participants for attending. So thank you all so much, everyone. And uh, we hope you have a good rest of your day. See you later.